Welcome, Hoosier fans, to another victorious episode of the Assembly Call, as tonight the Indiana Hoosiers are victorious at home against the IPFW Mastodons, 90-65. to We are going to break it all down for you tonight. I am your host, Jared Morris. I am joined tonight by my usual co-hosts, Andy Bottoms and Ryan Phillips, and a new face and voice for you all, Josh Eastern, who is a freshman at Indiana, one of our interns, you guys all got to meet Michael uh, when he uh, stepped in at the last second and hosted the post-game show after the St. John's game, and Josh is here tonight to provide his, provide his insight on this game as well. Uh, and before we get started, just a quick reminder to make sure that you go to assemblycall.com slash subscribe and get on our email list so that you get all of our coverage throughout the week and throughout the season. Well, let's start, as we always do, with our banner moment uh, and it's pretty clear what the banner moment is, and sorry uh, to any of the other three of you guys who wanted to talk about uh, this fine young man and his performance tonight, but you can talk about him too because it's one of the best performances he's put up in an Indiana uniform, and there have been plenty of good performances, but that is Yogi Ferrell, who set his career high tonight with 38 points. He also added five assists and five rebounds to that. He was 12 of 18 from the floor, 4 of 8 from downtown, 10 of 10 from the free throw line. But here's what I was really impressed with when it came to Yogi tonight. I mean, obviously the shooting was great. But what I really liked is that Indiana started out pretty sluggishly in this game. It was 17-17 at the under 12-minute timeout in the first half. Kind of back and forth. You know, everybody who was at the game following along on Twitter, all the beat writers who were there basically said that, you know, the crowd, the team, everybody was just kind of sluggish to begin. And what I liked about Yogi is he got aggressive and started taking the ball to the basket. And not just like we often see him, where he takes the ball to the basket to pass, and sometimes will pass up wide open layups because he's so focused on hitting a teammate. He went to the bucket to score tonight, and I like that. And he got fouled, he went to the line, he converted. He had a really aggressive mindset. And, you know, it's one thing to do that at home against IPFW. I would really like to see Yogi channel some of that into Indiana's tougher games on the road because I think sometimes in those games, you know, Yogi will play well, but I think he'll pass up some opportunities to be even more aggressive offensively when his team needs him. And I thought tonight he stepped up when his team needed him when it was a little bit sluggish early and really set the tone offensively and just had a terrific night. I mean, I don't care if you're playing IPFW or anybody else, 38 points is impressive. Uh, and so a tip of the cap to Yogi uh, for one of his best games and certainly the leader tonight for Indiana as the Hoosiers win by 25. All right, let's go around the horn, get some opening thoughts from everybody. Ryan, we will start with you, uh, your rant on tonight's IU performance. Well, I think it's, it's got to be Troy Williams for me. I think that uh, he was really involved on both ends of the floor. He had uh, 15 points, 19 rebounds, which was a career high, 16 defensive rebounds, which is insane. He out-rebounded IU, uh, IPFW in the first half by himself. Uh, and then he also had five blocks. But the problem with Troy, it's you always take the good with the bad. He also had five turnovers, and a lot of them just seemed to be Troy turnovers, where he just tries to do too much, tries to force things, instead of just, you know, I hate to use coach speak, but staying within himself and doing what, you know, he can do. And, you know, Tom Crean said it in a press conference in, in Maui, and I swear half the – the, the press there had to hold back laughter when they said, he said, you know, Troy can't throw behind the back pass. That's not his game. And and I'm not saying he did that tonight, but I'm saying that's just an example of things that he's got to just continue to do what he does. I mean, when he's focused on the glass, 19 rebounds, again, against a lesser opponent, but he could easily average a double-double in the, in the Big Ten if he was focused, you know. He can easily get 10 points and 10 rebounds. We know that. We've seen him do it. And so tonight, you know, you take the good with the bad. I mean, obviously, it's amazing to have 19 rebounds by yourself. Uh, his 16 defensive rebounds, IPFW only had 18 defensive rebounds as a team. I mean, so that's just unbelievable performance from Troy on the glass. Uh, he seemed to be willing to pass the ball around. He wasn't forcing his own offense. He had 15. He also had 7 of 11 from the free throw line, which is seems to be slowly improving a little bit. Um, but, you know... He's just got to stop turning the ball over. And and for him to take that next step, we've always talked about with him, is Troy going to take the next step? Is he going to jump up? Is he going to move up a level? He's got to stop turning the ball over. It just hurts your team, wasted possessions like that, even in a high-scoring up-and-down, back-and-forth game. When you're not the primary ball handler, if you're giving him five turnovers, you're having a rough night. So 
Again, great performance in some aspects from Troy. On the other end, he's got to take care of the ball. He's got to value that ball more. Andy, your bottom line on tonight's IU victory. Um, you know, I, I was going to hit on either of those guys, but uh, I'll uh, I'll just briefly touch on each of the other two who hit double figures, which were Robert Johnson, uh, who everybody knows I'm a big fan of, ended up with 16 points, was perfect from three-point range, uh, actually made a six kind of right after a foul got called, uh, a stunner in this game that it was after a foul call, which was pretty much every moment in this game. But um, I thought he did a really good job, you know, got you know a little bit of foul trouble early, but thought he settled down nicely and... Um, you know, had another good game since being moved back into the starting lineup. And then Max Bielfeld, I thought, played his second really strong game in a row. He was 5 of 7 from the floor, uh, took 1-3 there toward the end that I didn't love. But, you know, what I liked in going back and watching the Moorhead State game and in most of um, tonight's game was, you know, he'd gotten away, and this seems to be a bit of a theme with him, from taking some of those perimeter shots that we had kind of been surprised to see him take early and, and hope that he would, you know, get away from a little bit as as time went on. I think he's done a really nice job of that. So he had 11 and 8 off the bench on a night when, uh, you know, Thomas Bryant didn't didn't give a, a whole lot on the stat sheet. So I thought he's had, you know, two of his better games back-to-back. -back. So I think that's a positive and um, hard to say whether this team is settling into a rotation uh, from a, a lineup standpoint. But, you know, Johnson has certainly fared well since getting back into the starting lineup. And Bielfeld really seems to be giving him off the bench what uh, I know myself and a lot of other IU fans uh, hoped and thought that he would uh, at the beginning of the season. He seems to be settling into a role a bit uh, after, you know, just some, uh, I think some probably struggles to acclimate to what he was being asked to do early in the season. But seems to be uh, really settling in. So I think both those are positive developments for IU, uh, particularly on a night when, you know, Blackman and, and Bryant combined to score only eight points, I think. And we will get to them. But first, Josh Eastern, your debut on the assembly call. We don't have a clever name for your segment yet, but I'm sure we'll come up with one. What were your thoughts yeah, we on this IU victory? Uh, I mean, it was it was a good, well-rounded effort. It, it it was sluggish, like we mentioned earlier. It wasn't like they got out to a great start, but eventually they put IPFW, a lower opponent, away, and they had a double-digit lead for almost most of the game. But one player I do want to touch on, Harrison... Uh, Bear with me if I screw this up. Nego, I think that's how you pronounce yeah, it. Nego. It is. It's Nego. Nego. Yeah. Nego, okay. Uh, he he came in, hasn't really played much this season, came in in kind of garbage time in some other blowouts, but he came in, and he was good on defense. He had some great defensive plays. Um, uh, Coach Kareen, I could see him on the sideline. He was happy with, with how he was playing on defense, and I think that's pretty important with a team that's defense isn't their forte. If you can have somebody who can come off the bench – almost kind of like a Tony Allen in, in the NBA. He, he, he's not going to score for you, but he can get those tough rebounds. He, got, he had uh, four rebounds on the night, had some good defensive plays. And I think that's kind of big for this team, that their identity isn't necessarily defense, but if you can put him in there and, and the other floor, if they can put the ball in the basket, which I think they'll be able to do, um, uh, Niego can, can be a, a good player for this Indiana team this season. We're going to have to get a final ruling on this because uh, on the broadcast, Andy Witcher and then Alex McCarthy said that it's Nego. Apparently, Fish was saying Niego, so we're going to have to find out exactly what oh, this okay. is. You know, but it was it was nice to see uh, to see Harrison get in there because we talked before the season that one of the weaknesses of this Indiana team was depth at the guard spot. You know, what would happen? You know, you've got Yogi, you've got Blackman, you've got uh, uh, Robert Johnson, and you've got Zeisloft. What happens if one of those guys gets hurt? What happens if one of those guys gets in foul trouble? Well, we saw it tonight when the officials were calling fouls on almost literally every single play, and Blackman had three early fouls, and Diego had to come in there, and he did a good job. I mean, Harrison ended up with four rebounds, which was double the combined total of Blackman and Thomas Bryant. I mean, Ryan, what did you think of, of Niego, and, and how important do you think it is, I guess, that he gets some time in a game like this? Because, again, we don't know when we'll need him, but I have a feeling at some point in an important Big Ten game, he'll need to play 10 to 15 minutes, and I like that at least he was able to do that and that Tom Crean gave him an extended look tonight because, again, we don't know when it'll come, but I have a feeling we're going to need him at some point. Yeah, I mean, look, you've got the guy on the roster. He's a freshman. It's not like he's some walk-on senior who's just there to pick up a pair of candy striped pants. I mean, he's a young guy who had offers from some Division One schools, chose to go to Indiana, and, you know, he's clearly got some talent, and, and you might as well run him out there and give him some time if guys are in foul trouble. I mean, I, I see no reason not to. Uh, 
if it's a game, I mean, look, you're not going to throw them in if this was the opener of Big Ten play and it's a tight game. You're not going to do that. But this is a game that they should win. They should win going away. And they did. And he got some first half minutes. This wasn't garbage time. And he played really well. And then he played in the second half and, and played really well for what was expected. He's not going to be a guy that's going to get you 20 points. But if you're expecting, you know, a guy to come in and be competent and play defense and, you know, be just solid and not make any mistakes, not hurt you, and make some positive plays, he can do that. And that's what we've been told by everybody who watched him in, in, in high school and, and who knew his profile when he arrived at IU. So, you know, you got the guy, you might as well throw him out there and use him if you're in foul trouble instead of trying to mix, mix and match lineups, putting Hartman on the perimeter more, you know, things like that. Just stick with what you've got, put this guy in there, you've got him for a reason, and see what he can do. And, and I thought he acquitted himself well tonight. Andy, let's talk numbers real quick. If Will was here to give us his stat of the night, I have a feeling that he would mention one of these because they have been the stats that we've been the most focused on the last few games. One is turnovers, and we've been hoping that the Hoosiers would get that turnover number down. Tonight they turn it over on 23.3% of their possessions, which is not good. It needs to be much lower than that. And, and again, we saw more of the careless turnovers. You know, Colin Hartman had one where he just threw it into another guy's arms. You know, Troy Williams, many of the out-of-control variety. Thomas Bryant added four turnovers of his own. So that was a negative. Uh, it was another game where Indiana held an opponent around their season average in points per possession. Uh, well, actually, they, they held them well below their season average, and, for, and both halves was pretty equivalent. Uh, we held IPFW at about 0.81 points possession in the first half. Uh, they finished the game at 0.83 or 0.84 points per possession. So that was better, even though I think some of that was IPFW missing some open shots. And, Andy, I want to get your thoughts on the defense. But rebounding-wise, Indiana also did a good job cleaning up almost 80% uh, of IPFW's misses, which was nice. So, Andy, as you look at that points per possession number for IPFW, you know, it's in the, the .83 range. This is not a very good offensive team coming in, so we can't take too much from that. What would you think of the defense? Is it a number that's kind of propped up by them missing shots, or did you think some of the defensive improvement from the Moorhead State game carried over into this one? I thought it was a pretty uneven performance defensively. I think there were times when I saw some of the same things. I think... Um, you know, and some of it's odd. It's even within the same players. I thought there were some instances when Bryant did really well uh, when they ran high ball screens that he did a good job of hedging out and then recovering back. And then there are other times when they seemed confused about how they wanted to defend it and they didn't defend that the same way every time. So I think it, it wasn't just him, but uh, he was one that a couple times I, you know, I kind of noticed. Wow, wow, that really seems like he's improved that, but it wasn't consistent yet. So um, I think there were times when that was the case. I, I thought that. Throughout the game, they did get the ball in the lane a lot, and in some cases, they were taking challenge shots, which you've got to give at least some credit for for challenging those. You know, Troy had I think five blocks uh, in there, and and some things like that, and a couple of block charge calls went, you know, maybe differently than than I you had thought. I I just thought it was it was uneven. Where you saw some glimpses of what they were able to do against Morehead State, but it wasn't consistent. Um, you know, Evans the the uh, I think he ended up with 21 for IPFW. He's a you know, experienced and solid player. I thought they, you know, again, kind of did well at times to contain him and keep him out of the lane. And then there's other times where it felt like he got to, uh, you know, kind of wherever he wanted to go on the floor. And and certainly from three-point range, um, you know, I feel like IPFW, I'm not sure they made any shots in the mid-range. I know Ken Bykoff, you know, tweets out these shot charts. I'm not sure that at any point I saw a make from IPFW and really not a lot of shots that weren't either in the lane within a few feet of the basket or, or three pointers. And I think there were definitely open shots. So, um, I, I, I think that the, the part of that number that happened tonight that was real was based on the rebounding and being able to, uh, prevent second chances. Uh, the part that was probably propped up a little bit, I think is, is a little bit of what you suggested in terms of just missing some open shots that, um, you know, that they, they struggled to knock down. So I thought not as good as the Moorhead state performance, uh, throughout, thought there were times when they looked that good, but um, again, kind of lacking that consistency that we keep searching for uh, over the course of the season so far. And Josh, you wanted to mention something about the rebounding. Yeah, I thought it was a much better performance on the board tonight. Only 10 second chance points uh, for I uh, feel right. I know that we uh -oh. got a lot of down. All right, Josh, uh, we're going uh, to mute you real quick here. Something bad with your connection. Maybe uh, try and get out and get back in real quick. There was something off with your connection. Um, so real quick, I, you know, I want to mention this, and Ryan, let me get your thoughts on this. I want to get Andy's thoughts too. Uh, 
but so Justin Albers just tweeted this out. I don't want to make too big a deal about it, I guess, because I didn't see it. But the tweet from Justin Albers says, "Also, Tom Crean yelled at Tom Priller, or Tim Tom Priller, Tim Priller, for an entire possession for shooting that three. He was so mad his lip was quivering." Now. You know, I suppose I understand that if it's you know a shot not in the offense and whatever if they've been coached on that. But I, I distinctly recall a play uh, in I think it was in the second half off of a made basket where IPFW's guy I don't remember who it was got the ball took it coast to coast after a made basket and made a layup where no Indiana player got back, no Indiana player hustled enough to get in front of him. And I even tweeted out at the time, how does no one get put on the bench after watching a guy go coast to coast? And I just, I wonder, I guess, about the logic of chewing out Tim Priller for airballing a three when, it, you know, you have a game where you're turning it over on almost 24% of the possessions. I didn't see anybody getting chewed out for turnovers. You know, certainly didn't see anybody getting chewed out for really lackadaisical defense. Uh, you know, that kind of thing, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Andy, uh, Ryan, any, any thoughts on that? You know, why, you know, you would see yelling at a guy at the end of the game when so many things go on throughout the game that deserve plenty of more scorn? Uh, you know, I I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know. You, you, again, it's I think it's making something where we don't know all the information. It could be that there was a set play they were running and Priller just fired it up. Um, you know, we don't know. So I think that things like this are really stupid to get involved in because it's, I mean, yeah, he got mad at, at Tim Priller who wouldn't hurt a fly. But at the same time, you don't know that he's not yelling at guys in the, in, the, in the huddle or he's not going to focus all day in film tomorrow about guys not getting back. I mean, it's, I, think it's, I think it's people looking for snapshots of things and not understanding the overall situation. I mean, I'm not defending yelling at Tim Priller. I'm just saying that it, it just seems like we're, oh, well, we noticed he was yelling at him there. I mean, you don't know. Are you focused on him yelling at people throughout the entire game? Do you know what's going on in team huddles? Do you know why guys are being pulled out, why they're being put in? I mean, it's... It just sort of—it's just sort of. I think it's—it's it's looking too deeply into something. I really do. Yeah, I mean, but we've I, seen I, enough of this to to see you know times where coaches in the past certainly would chew a guy out for consistently turning it over, not playing defense, letting a guy drive right by him. I mean, we don't see any—we don't really often see that kind of passion getting upset with a guy during the regular course of a game. But I mean, do we know that? I mean, do we know what they're what he's saying to them when he pulls them off the floor? Do we know what he's saying to them in team huddles, in the locker room, in you know practice, things like that? I mean, if you say something to a guy ten thousand times, maybe there's a different you know maybe guys respond differently to yelling as opposed to talking, like certain specific guys. I I mean, I don't know. It's just it's one of those things where we're not in the room all the time. We don't know what's going on. We're also not in the huddles. We also don't know the play calls. I, mean, I just think it's looking too deeply into stuff. Now, look, if he had punched Priller, then we could talk about it. Like, you know, that's that's the, like, but you know, yeah, okay. But the thing is, I think IU fans just want to see some of that from the coach. They want to see the coach get as upset as the fans seem to be when the def the effort on defense isn't there, when the focus with all the turnovers isn't there. Okay, that's what I mean. We don't here's, see here's, that. Here's here's what I'm gonna say though, is that that to me is I like I get it. I, I get what you're trying to say, and you're trying to say you want to see fire and yelling. We've seen that before. People are just ignoring that if you don't think you've seen that before. The other thing is, did you ever see Brad Stevens scream at a player? No, oh boy. Did you, have you ever seen... No, I'm just using <laughs> him as an example. The, the, do you see certain guys yell at players? It, it, different things work for different people differently. I'm not saying that's the right approach for IU. I'm not saying it's the wrong approach. I'm just saying that because you don't see it, on the floor in the game when you're looking at it doesn't mean that it's not happening. And I'm also I'm, I'm just saying I think it's a stupid thing to worry about. Tim Perillo took a bad shot and he got yelled at. Now does and, and saying well why are you yelling at Priller? Well I you treat all your players the same. They're all in practice together. I mean, if Troy took that shot, I bet he'd get yelled at too. But that's the point. Would he? Because we haven't seen that. Okay, you ended the argument because you invoked Brad Stevens' name, so you win, which is really clever by you on an IU show. But Andy, do you want to come in and kind of break this uh, break this tie here? Am I making a mountain out of a molehill, or is are you on Ryan's side? I, I mean, I I can't. I can't never really agree with Ryan on here. I mean, I feel like that would, <laughs> the show would just really come unhinged if that happened. But I mean, I do think it's a little bit much to make of it. But I agree with your your general point of if 
I guess I, the way I think about it is this. Tim Priller is never, at any point this season, going to be in the game at a meaningful moment. So if he came in and shot that three-pointer every time he came in the game, it would never matter. And so I don't really, you know, if you kind of put it in that context, like I'm not sure what the teaching moment is there with Tim Priller because it isn't going to be that, well, we're, you know, it's you know, there's 30 seconds left in the Maryland game and Priller's going to be out there and like, well, he's going to harken back to this moment and think, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take that shot because I got yelled at against IPFW. He's not going to be in that game. Whereas, you know, a guy letting someone drive to the basket without any resistance or a, a guy, you know, throwing a lazy pass out of bounds that we've seen before could certainly be out there, and I'm not sure that that really, you know, uh, you know, makes as much sense. But I talked about it way too much, so in that regard, I guess it's making a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah, I just, uh, my, my thing is, is that, like, you don't know, maybe Priller was told something specific before he went in the game, like, hey, by the way, we want you to cut through this way and shoot your three from over here, or... And, and he didn't do it. You don't know. We They're don't not know. running plays for him. They're not running. He's not setting up plays to run for Tim okay, Priller and then tell him. Maybe he is. Running. But by but that logic, can't know. can't we assume that Troy Williams was told not to turn it over five times? I mean, that's yeah. what I mean. Like, so where is that kind of of just fire getting after a guy when they completely don't do things game after game after game? Now, that's now look. Saying. I'm not defending yelling at Tim Priller. I haven't. I've said that straight out. I think it's stupid. I think it's a waste of your damn time. But saying like, why don't we see that? Ryan, why do you hate Tim Priller? Why don't we just get to that? Why do you not like Tim Priller? What's wrong with you? I, I I have a thing against Shaggy. Okay, I've always. I think he's lazy. I think Shaggy is lazy and makes Scooby Doo all work for him. That's why. No, I I think it's it's. It's just stupid to like to, to to focus on this of all things, and you know there's going to be message board posts and people screaming about this and everything. It's like it's one friggin' play. I mean, you saw. Okay, what sends a bigger message? I'm sorry. What what is more effective? Yelling at Tim Priller for two minutes or whatever, or not letting Troy Williams start the second half of a basketball game when he doesn't play defense. I'm sorry, this, the not starting the second half sends a much stronger message than yelling at Tim But how often has that happened? The point has nothing, to do, has nothing to do with yelling at Tim Priller. It's when are you going to yell at someone for turning it over? When are you going to yell at a starter for not being in a stance on defense? That's the point. It has nothing well, to do with I'm Priller. Saying, no, and, and what I'm saying is, is that to get the message out to those guys, maybe you bench them and don't let them start as opposed to screaming at them. If, you, if they're constantly on the floor and you're constantly yelling and constantly, they're, they're just, at some point, maybe they're tuning it out and you do other things to do it. Now, again, this is a stupid argument to talk about. It's a stupid topic to bring up because it's Tim Priller. Like who cares? I bet I bet Priller is suspended for the first thirty eight minutes and thirty seconds of the next game though. That's gonna send a message. But honestly, like does does right, Tim Priller done. taking this three have any effect on anything else for the rest of this season? I mean was, I mean I understand that. Well if I mean, he had made like, it, the okay. assembly hall roof would have come off, so it could have oh, had that impact. He's, yeah, he's a true. scholarship I mean, player at Indiana. There is at least something expected of him. He's not a walk-on. Now, that's Crean's fault. Don't get me wrong. But, the, you know, if you say, hey, go in and do this, and a player doesn't do that, a basketball coach is competitive. He's going to tell you. Right, you know, so you yell at like the people. other guys, too. That's the point. That's the but whole point. You're, you're Let's see it from like somebody else. Never, you're acting like he's never yelled at anybody else ever or that he's never done anything to anybody else ever when they've – like, okay, I'm sorry, when 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 uh, Emmett Holt got kicked off the team, he straight up said, I don't have any leaders on this team. Now, what would be more effective, yelling at Yogi Ferrell or saying to people, I don't have any leaders on this team publicly? Which no, is that, harsher? It was, that was nice to see, and we mentioned that. It's going to be really funny when Justin Albers uh, tweets a, a, a retraction and says, oh, yeah, by the way, his lip wasn't quivering. I, I, mis <laughs> I misunderstood. I mean, yeah, you know, it's one of those things. It's just, it's just a dumb thing. Like, it's, it's a little side note in All right, this but, game. Okay, but okay, but it's not I dumb know, because I know Indiana's fan base, and this is going to be the biggest story coming out of this. It's game. because I, they want to see some discipline and accountability, and there have been a few moments of it. But overall, we don't see the bench used as much for discipline and accountability as we could, and we don't see a lot of that fire when guys make the same mistakes time after time after time. That's the only I, point uh, I'm and making. And I'm not disagreeing with that. What I'm saying is that we're making way too big a deal out of this because it was a momentary thing where he yelled at a guy 
And you don't know what goes on in practice behind closed doors. You don't know what goes on in that locker room. No, but room I see what's happening wrong. during games, and it's not changing. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but it, it, <laughs> all right. I mean, okay, if you genuinely think yelling at Troy Williams will make him not turn the ball over, I'm sorry, my friend. You have not been watching. Well, you nothing else has been working. <laughs> All right, all right. So let's move on, Andy. Let's talk about James Blackman Jr. and Thomas Bryant. Uh, pick one of those guys to talk about. You know, neither one really got in the flow. And and, and you know, Thomas has been up and down. I, I, to me, it's almost more concerning to see James play like this. I mean, he's been up and down, but these are the, typically the games where he comes out and plays well. Uh, and you know, I guess for better or worse, because we often see him, you know, dominate lesser competition and really struggle. But to see him come out and not see kind of the smart aggressiveness that we've seen from him this year, any of the rebounding, it was just odd to see him never get in the flow at all. Yeah, I don't. I definitely. I, yeah, I'll definitely talk about him. I mean, we can we can touch on Brian as well. But you know, I thought with with James again, it seemed like. Maybe in contrast to Robert Johnson, he got in a little bit of early foul trouble as well, but he didn't really ever bounce back from that, and it, it felt like it took him out of the game. Um, he scored four points, but I think he scored them really early and right in you know one basket right after the other, uh, and really probably for the last I'm going to say 35-ish minutes of of game time. I'm not sure that he scored at all, um, but didn't get you know and and again scoring isn't everything, but didn't get any rebounds, didn't have any assists, did have a steal, um, didn't have any turnovers, had the three fouls, missed all three of his three pointers, and made. You know, two of about two of his three uh, two point shots, and it ends up. I mean, if the site I'm looking at, I usually do the plus minus on my own, but this at least is usually in the in the neighborhood. I mean, he was minus one tonight. I mean, I don't know how you know he can't do that against this kind of opponent. Um, and it seems like really since he had that great game against Alcorn State, where we talked about you know it was more than just the opponent; it was kind of his approach to the game and things like that. I thought you know really let the fouls take him out of it. I thought particularly that happened on the defensive end. Um, you know, he was a guy that everybody, you know, really was watching a lot of in that initial, uh, you know, in that Moorhead State game, and you know, people commented on how he was, you know, down in a defensive stance and really seemed to be taking more pride in that. And I, there were multiple instances tonight where he just didn't. It was kind of like the, you know, same old thing where, you know, kind of lax on closing out on guys. It didn't really, you know, work too hard to stay in front of somebody. I think uh, another case where he could have stepped in to take a charge that he didn't. Um, so it seemed like he fell back into some of those old habits, and I, you know, I would agree with you that it feels like we're, you know, not quite midway, but getting close to the midway point of his sophomore season. You just like to see more consistency from him. But I think on the defensive end, I mean, I think he's a microcosm of what I talked about earlier with the team, where there's some possessions he's there, and some possessions he's not. Um, but again, I just thought, you know, mentally, Johnson didn't let the early fouls kind of take him out of it, and Blackman did, and he never really rebounded from. Um, well, never really rebounded at all in the game, but never really rebounded from, uh, you know, the kind of those early struggles. Um, so I think that's definitely a, definitely a concern. Um, but you know, again, trying not to make too much out of great performances, trying not to make too much out of bad ones. But I think that's, uh, you know, of the two, the one that concerns me the most, because um, I think some of Bryant's at least is. They mentioned illness on the show. Uh, I know they've talked about how he's been kind of banged up and trying to limit his minutes, so I don't know if that was a factor for him, but I haven't really heard any of those things about James, so uh, nothing else to really kind of, you know, th throw that on. Uh, so we'll, uh, I think, Josh, if you want to talk about Bryant, we can we can kind of transition to him. Yeah, yeah I mean, he, yeah, he only took three shots on the night, and one one field goal. He had his his other two points were were from the free throw line. But when they went to him on the post, he made a great post move, put it up with authority, and it it it, it looked like a like a finished big. I mean, he's he's obviously not a finished big yet. He's he's getting there. But I think kind of looking for him on the post, getting him open on the post because he can do so much. He's he's shown that he can pass it out of the post, and that opens up Yogi Ferrell or whoever's on the wing out there. Um, but I think getting the offense kind of almost not every possession based around him, but kind of seeking him out a little bit more, having him post up and maybe working. I don't know what happens in, in practice if they're if the if that's what they're working on, but kind of seeking him out because his post move, his one post move he did make was very good. And if you can kind of keep repeating that, I think there's something to to look into there. Ryan, what are your thoughts on Thomas's progression so far? I mean, I, and, and I, I got a lot of questions on Twitter tonight about him. It, you know, people kind of concerned, you know, think, you know, kind of disappointed, I guess, in some of his inconsistencies. And, and 
you know, I, I do, and and we get on Tom Crean a little bit about this, you know, with some of his comments that he makes in pregame and postgame. But you know, it is true that Thomas is young; he's a freshman, and there are going to be some growing pains. And and he isn't quite the shot blocking presence that we thought that he could be coming in, you know. And yet he does show flashes of of that offensive game, and and certainly the effort and the enthusiasm, even if sometimes the positioning or you know even just you know the hands you know some of those things just haven't quite been there what are your thoughts on him so far I mean is he what you expected are you disappointed at all with how he's progressing or is this about what we should expect from him so far at this point is probably what we should expect considering he had a foot injury considering he's banged up considering he's been sick that's going to stunt your development early in the season he's also a freshman I mean he's learning as he goes so uh, he's not a guy who's just raw, you know, and and un, untrained with a super athletic, you know, body or anything like that. He's not that guy. He needs to have strength. He needs to work on his athleticism. I mean, he gained a lot on his vertical this summer by working out, by finally, you know, getting a good strength coach and getting into that. A lot of kids don't have that when they come into college. And so he's also dealing with, you know, whatever they're adding to his body, whatever they're they're changing with him. Uh, offensively, I think he's pretty polished. Uh, he's He's got some really advanced post moves. He doesn't always show it, but he's got them in his bag of tricks, and he's just got to get the confidence to go to those more often when he gets the ball down there. Sometimes, I, like tonight, he you know he traveled once when he had the ball, and he really didn't need to. You know, If he just settled in and, and did what he knows he can do, uh, he would have been fine. Defensively, he's still got to work on his lateral quickness. That's really the big issue for him. It's not timing. It's not knowledge. It's not understanding what to do. He's just got to work on his lateral quickness, and, and he's got to make it so he can get there in time when he needs to help out and block a shot or or needs to you know reposition against his guy or something like that. That's something that's going to happen over time. You're not just going to flip a switch on something like quickness or athleticism or strength. That takes time, and and those are really the deficiencies in his game. Now, I think a lot of people expected because he was a five-star McDonald's All-American, he's going to come in and be Cody Zeller, and and you know, really be a be an All-American and you know, all Big Ten and all that stuff. It takes time to get there, and he's just not that guy right now. That doesn't mean that he can't be an All-American, or that he's not on track to maybe be an outstanding next-level post player. He's a two-year guy, I think at least, and. But it's not because he's raw. See, I think when people think like, "Oh, he's going to stick around for a while," they're thinking, "Well, he's you know, Hunter Perea, where he has a ton of work to do, and he's a project." He's not at all. He can be a contributing player this year and and be a really good post presence that can help us out and help change the team offensively and defensively in that way. But it's going to take time for him to be a star, and and so. You've got to take the contributions he can give to you. Tonight, I just it felt like, you know, listening on the radio broadcast, it just felt like he never got into the game. And again, it might be that he's banged up or sick or whatever, but you're not going to force feed a guy when Troy and Yogi and Robert Johnson are all playing well. You're not going to say, okay, guys, stop what you're doing. We're just going to throw the ball into the post now. It gets everybody else out of it can get everybody else out of rhythm. You just keep going where you're going. If you've got a 24 point lead, you're not going to completely change what you're doing just to feed the post. So it's got to come at organically out of the offense. And I think that other games we'll see him get 15 points and you know eight rebounds this year, and I won't be surprised by it. And I'm not surprised by tonight either because I think that, again, he's just got to get comfortable, and it's going to take time. He's facing 22-year-old guys you know, for the first time in his career and in his life, and so he's got to you know, get used to it, get comfortable with it, and it's going to take time. Josh, you were in the arena tonight, right, for the first half? Yeah, uh, yes, I was. What was it like? I mean, obviously, you know, we saw the pictures, and I, I think it was announced as a sellout, but it looked like there probably weren't more than ten thousand people there. Yeah, yeah I mean, no. what what was the atmosphere like? Um, I mean, it was it it wasn't like like other games. I mean, it was just kind of a, a subdued crowd, I'd say. I mean, it's just a Wednesday night, week before finals. The students, it was it was a decent student section. One of the balconies totally empty. Um, there were scattered seats. There, there were amount of, a good amount of uh, IPFW fans making the trip down, um, but I mean, just not a not the same energy I feel like we've seen from other weekend games or from the Creighton game. Just kind of a subdued crowd. Never really fully got into it. But I mean, when Troy Williams had those some blocks in the second half, I, I stayed for like until the first time out of the second half. Um, 
crowd was into it on that. Uh, Troy had some other good rebounds. Yogi made a couple threes. They got into it, but I mean, there was nothing really to spark the crowd too much. I would say. Hey, Andy, I want to ask you about Colin Hartman. Uh, I had a couple questions on Twitter during the game too. You know, there was a uh, he. Oh, there's the turnover that I mentioned earlier. When it was just you know boneheaded turnover, which those happen, you know throws it right into the guy's arms, and I actually I tweeted with the hashtag not Colin Hartman things, and and someone tweeted back that it doesn't seem like we're seeing quite as many Colin Hartman things this year, and it, it does seem to me a little bit like he's been up and down, and you know like Ryan mentioned with with Thomas Bryant and kind of the injuries and the illness, you know Colin had an injury too, you know coming into the season that we weren't even you know no one was quite sure when he was going to be available, and and he seems to be. You know, we saw for a few games there when he was coming off the bench with Robert Johnson, really seemed to help get the team into the flow. And he has been one of the guys consistently, you know, solid with defensive rotations and being in the right place. And yet, you know, hasn't really found the touch with the shooting. I think he was hitting 33% of his threes coming in. Doesn't seem to quite be in the same amount of sync on offense either like he was last year. What, what are you noticing from Collins so far this year? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was. I, I think the big thing difference that I'm seeing is just kind of struggling with the shot a little bit. I, you know, he's still doing. If you look tonight, he had four rebounds, three assists, uh, a block. Did have those couple turnovers, but I thought overall, you know, again, continues to be a guy who's, you know, shows good awareness defensively and and those kinds of things. So I think it's um, to me, I feel like the big difference is he's just not making shots. Um, now maybe that's because of you know, the injury, I think it was a rib injury, so, you know, really being able to kind of, you know, extend his jump shot and some of those things may have may have hurt him in the end. But, um, you know, he's not he, he's not a guy who's going to use a bunch of possessions anyway. Um, and really, as you, you know, you kind of look down, he really, you know, made a couple threes against Alcorn State. And other than that, you know, hasn't made more than one three in a game, and that was really what he was doing well uh, last year when he, was, when he was hitting on all cylinders. So he's only had one game where he scored over six points, um, but has, you know, done a fairly consistent job on the glass, you know, grabbing a few rebounds each game, uh, you know, limiting the turnovers and things like that. So I'm not terribly worried. I also think, you know, we talked a little bit about, you, you know, the lineup being the same for the, you know, the, these last couple games. Uh, you know, he's been in and out of the starting lineup a little bit. I think we've also talked uh, about how, um, you know, just some of those kinds of things and, and trying to figure out what his minutes need to be. Uh, last year, I think we all felt he was playing too many minutes, a lot of times out of necessity. And so I think it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit trying to, to sort out his role on this team as well. But I think if he can, you know, settle into this, you know, kind of bench role that he's had now, he's been able to provide some good minutes at a couple different positions. And um, I, I, you know, ultimately don't feel... Uh, too worried about him. I think it's just a matter of getting his shot to fall. I think that's going to give him some additional confidence. But um, I think he's doing a nice job of passing the ball, moving, and, and uh, really doing the right things on defense. So uh, he's not a guy that I'm too concerned with, uh, simply because I don't think he's a guy that uh, points for me won't tell the story about him one way or the other. Uh, but I do think you know a, a lot of what he did last year was related to you know stepping out, hitting threes. And, uh, and really spreading out the defense. He hasn't been able to do a lot of that this year, and so I don't know if that's why people are, are worried or not, but I'm not uh, I'm not really concerned for him as of now. All right, quick pop quiz. Ryan, I'll go to you on this first. Obviously, Nick Zeisloff leads the team in O rating uh, because he's ridiculous, and he's sixth in the country if you remove the uh, number of possessions used. Uh, outside of him, who is top on the team in offensive rating coming into this game? Um. Anybody? Well, Hartman was the guy last year, mm -hmm. but I think not, this is gonna, not Hartman. I was gonna say I think this is a trick question. I'm gonna go Max Bielfeld. Max Bielfeld, you are correct. It is Max Bielfeld. He's been very he's been very efficient this year, and quite frankly, he's been a phenomenal pickup. I mean, say what you want about Green, that was a great pull. Uh, kid has been. We got in on him late, and kid has been everything. At, he's been advertising far better than we thought he would be. And Andy, he's assuaged our concern somewhat. You know, especially in the exhibition games in the first couple of games, we were a little concerned about just the shots he was taking, and some of them seeming to come a little bit out of the offense and being overly aggressive looking for a shot. And again, you know, some of this is based on the competition that Indiana's playing, but that number is adjusted for competition. But you know, I, I think we, we don't need to worry so much about him taking shots outside of the offense. For the most part, he's done a good job of 
picking his spots nicely and being aggressive in games where he needs to be aggressive and, and taking a step back and letting the other offensive guys do their work when, when they're firing on all cylinders. Yeah, I mean, like I said at the beginning, I think he's really, in these past few games, um, done a really nice job of, of making some adjustments to how he played and um, you know taking fewer of those outside shots and really concentrating on being around the basket. And if you look... Um, you know, his two-point percentage is just unreal. I know he hasn't taken – he just hasn't taken a ton of shots, period. But, you know, this game, five for six. Last game, five for five. Duke game only took one two-pointer. Alcorn State, four for five. UNLV, three for four. Three for three against St. John's. So I think he's doing a better job of kind of figuring out where he needs to be. He's done a, a nice job on the glass, you know, grabbing at least a couple offensive rebounds per game in this recent stretch and being able to get some easy baskets that way and showing some decent post moves. I mean, he's, he's a guy who's got, you know, certainly when we talk about, you know, Bryant and what he's going to develop into, we all hope um, from a post move standpoint, you know, Beal felt a guy who's been around, he's been through the big 10. He's got, you know, a few more things in his arsenal. While he may not be as athletically talented as, as Bryant is naturally, he does have that game experience where he can, um, you know, use some different moves to get himself shots inside. So I think he's done a really nice job of adjusting how he's played. And I think that his shooting percentage tells about as good a story as you can tell um, when you look over that over the last couple games. And I think, you know, again, we kind of talk through, you know, lineups and roles and all that stuff. You know, if he's, you know, really going to be the guy who's able to spell Brian off the bench, um, still been playing, you know, decent minutes, uh, you know, in the, you know, 19 19- 20 minutes a game, I think that's the kind of thing that we all hoped he would do at the beginning of the season. You know, six, eight points, you know, five rebounds in 20 minutes of action. I think that's what he's been able to give, uh, you know, in these last couple games. So I I think a positive development for him, uh, again, kind of settling in, even though he was with the team over the summer, um, there's a lot to be said for, you know, figuring out where in game, you know, he's going to fit into the offense and into the system and where he's going to be able to be the most effective. So, you know, at least for these last couple games, been really impressed with how he's he's changed some of that and to your point I think he's you know I, I feel like I could count on one hand you know the number of uh, you know deeper shots that he's taken uh, you know since some of those some of those early games Josh yeah so Crean said this week he was obsessed with recruiting Max Bielfeld I think he knew how important he would be to this team this year he's he can step out shoot the three he can get rebounds inside and with a front line that's young and a team that's fairly young, he's been a great senior presence that has come in right off the bat and has contributed immediately. And he's going to be, once you get into Big Ten play, he's going to be an invaluable piece to this team just because of that kind of, just kind of grooming Thomas Bryant and being a big, um, working with some other of the young guys. I mean, James Blackman Jr. and Robert Johnson are still sophomores, uh, but he's that senior presence with Yogi Ferrell on this team that's going to be key, especially through this tough patch that they've gone through at the start of the season, to kind of get this team back on track. And he's been with Michigan. He's been through the gauntlet of the Big Ten. And he's he's going to be a big piece this year for the Hoosiers, no doubt. Yeah, and Ryan, you wanted to touch on Max as well. Yeah, um, Max is – it's an interesting thing because, you know, he, he was really advertised as just kind of being a body for Big Ten play. And would you guys stop laughing? Uh <laughs> Uh, Andy just disappeared again. <laughs> yeah, I know. It happens whenever there's something funny going on. Uh, but he, he, we just kind of learned he was sort of like a just a Big Ten body, you know, who's going to come in and, and grab rebounds and, and be tough on the interior. He's got, some, he's got some really good post moves. He's shown confidence in them. I mean, that's why his shooting percentage is so high. These aren't jump shots. He's, he's making moves in the basket and doing really well. And he was shooting 54% from three coming into the game. I mean, he's only, what is he, like 7 of 12 six for, for 11. the year? Yeah, 6 for 11 coming in or something. So I think he's at 50% now because he missed one tonight. But, I mean, he can hit that. It's just a matter of not shooting it five times a game, you know. So, you know, I, I, I was really impressed in Maui. He was one of the guys who really stood out to me as being, you know, having a great tournament in Maui compared to the rest of the team. He looked brilliant. Uh, but he and he and Zaisal are the two guys who really impressed me in person in Maui, and, and he was much better than advertised. I mean, he, you know, it, it has a commanding presence down low and will take over when he needs to. But he's not going to demand the ball. He's not going to scream for it. He's going to go out and do his job. And when the ball comes to him, he's going to be able to finish. And and so I think he's a guy who, at some point in the Big Ten season, he's going to have a game where he does, where he has 15 and 10, and people are going to be like Max Bielfeld, really. And we're seeing now that he can do that. He's fully capable of that. So it shouldn't be a surprise when it happens. Yep. 
All right, well, let's go to some final thoughts, wrap this up. Again, the Hoosiers defeated IPFW exactly as they should. This is a game I think the Ken Palm spread had them winning by about 18. They exceeded that with a 25-point victory. So solid win for the Hoosiers. Let's get some final thoughts before we close up. Andy, we will go to you first. Well, I mean, this is feels like another game where I don't know how much we're going to learn from it. Um, certainly that same thing will be said for Saturday. McNeese State, sub-300 team on Ken Palm. Uh, so Ryan and I will fight again on that one. I look forward to it. I, although I actually won't be able to be on, but uh, I'm sure it'll be. I'm sure it'll be riveting. Hopefully, hopefully Priller will have learned his lesson, and you guys can put your differences behind you. But um, <laughs> you know, I don't know that we're going to learn a lot in that game. Again, I think you know, everybody's watching the defense at this point. Um, the offense seems to be uh, back on track a little bit, and and so I think again the defense is going to continue to be the focus. And I thought uh, tonight was. Certainly not a step forward from the Moorhead State game. Um, in in stretches, was a bit of a step back, and I think, you know, the the questions that are there, while they didn't get worse, and I know that was you know kind of your main message in the in the email you sent out after the last game, which I thought was a good one. It kind of, you know, kept everybody's worst fears at bay. I think that continued tonight, um, but you still saw some of those, you know, careless turnovers, and I thought. You know, the one thing that was interesting about that was, you know, it was about the same percentage in the second half as it was the first, and it, it felt like there were times this year when they really have a sloppy first half and kind of clean it up in the second and, and make you feel like, all right, well, that got put behind them. So that was one, you know, thing that I think you leave this game with a little bit of concern, and, uh, you know, you continue continue to see the defense that you'd want to see in stretches, uh, but not but not the whole game. But I think, you know, I think the biggest takeaway from here is just it was a, a really good performance from Yogi. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, I know we never really got back around to him, but I thought he, you know, start to finish played really well, made all ten of his free throws, uh, and, which I'm sure his his mom said she was going to work with him on it after some of the misses in Maui. So uh, I'm sure we can we can give Doc Libby some credit on that. But uh, you know, shot really well from there, a good all around game from him, and uh, and and kind of a, a vintage Troy performance of a lot of great things, some head scratching things, and. Uh, and again, kind of the Robert Johnson, Max Bielfelds of the team, you know, set, settling into to roles, hopefully. So definitely positives to take away. Definitely some question marks that uh, have been there already. And so uh, I think we'll, we're will we not going to get a lot of answers to any of those, you know, coming up in this next game. But we've got, you know, a week and a half um, from that Notre Dame game, which everybody's, uh, particularly after Maui and after Duke, got circled on the calendar. So, so far taking care of business in the games from there. And, just look for continued improvement on the defensive end and, and better carry the basketball against McNeese State. Absolutely. Josh, your final thoughts. Yeah, I just like Andy said, it's going to be turnovers. It's going to be defense. The offense is obviously going to be there. Um, but another thing I want to point out is, I mean, you have McNeese State this weekend. Got to get through that. This is another game where you can work on things. Like they're, they're in the 300s in, in, in Ken Baum, so I don't know how much you're going to be able to take from that. But get another good confidence win, win by 25, win by a lot. For the next week, it's going to be mental toughness. I mean, coming from the student, you got finals next week, and then you go up to Indianapolis, and you face a tough team in Notre Dame, a game that can, I wouldn't say make up for the, the bad Maui trip, but, I mean, that that's another big win that you need to take advantage of, the last chance at a big non-conference win. Uh, so just kind of fine-tuning some, some things for McNeese State, getting through finals next week, and then, hitting the ground running with Notre Dame, and that'll get you into the, the Big Ten season because right now Indiana is still looking for that marquee non-conference game that'll help them move up a, a spot in the, uh, in the tournament when it comes to that time. Hopefully we're talking about that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just it's kind of fine-tuning some, some things right now. It was much better performance tonight. Uh, IPFW shot just 35% from the floor, so got to attribute some of that to the defense, I'd say. Uh, but, yeah, just fine-tuning a couple things, getting ready for Notre Dame next week, get through McNeese State. Thanks, Josh, and excellent job for your first time on the assembly call. Hopefully we'll be able to get you, you on. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully we'll get you on some more episodes here in the future. Excellent job. Yes, uh, definitely. And now to someone who didn't do nearly as good a job as you did tonight, uh, Ryan Phillips, your final thoughts. <laughs> We're seriously going to fight through the computer screen. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care that hey, you're this is what this is what happens when we schedule all these 200 and 300 teams, you know? We gotta have something to talk about, right, <laughs> guys? We don't know this was totally scripted. We love each other. Uh, no, uh, I think tonight it's you know Indiana goes as Troy Williams does, good, bad, and some ugly. Uh, you know, at, at Troy Williams sets a career high in rebounds, dominates the glass, plays pretty well on offense for you know all things considered, 
and yet has a ton of turnovers, looks awful in some parts, and, and that's kind of IU right now. There are just parts of the game where they look brilliant. The ball movement sometimes, three point, the three-point shooting. Tonight they were getting to the lane, getting fouled, something that's been missing this year, hit a lot of free throws, you know, all that, battled with uh, some really bad foul calls, played through them, didn't react, just kind of accepted the game the way it was, and they put away an inferior opponent. But then there's the bad stuff. I mean, it's still there. These guys, you know, opponents are getting to the lane too easily. They're getting left open for shots. Guys are losing their man, focusing too much on the ball. Then sometimes they're focusing too much on their man and losing the ball. I mean, it's it's just a mixed bag right now. And, and as you guys have said, we're not going to learn a whole lot against McNeese State unless there's a loss. We'll learn a lot then. Um, but, you know, I think it's time this team needs to take that next step. Obviously, it's not going to happen against McNeese State. But they, as, as Josh said, that's a tune-up for – you know, Notre Dame, and, and that Notre Dame game looms large right now. I mean, that is going to be a name conference win by the end of the year, or a name non-conference win by the end of the year, and it's our last chance to, to make an impression on people in the preseason because we failed all of our tests so far against teams that are, you know, uh, supposedly impressive. I think the Creighton win was the only one where we look like a complete team, um, and, and other than that, you know, the, the only big wins have been against you know the only well played wins have been against lower tier competition. So let's let's uh, hopefully they come out against McNeese inspired. Hopefully there's more of a crowd, and then they got to roll into to no, the Notre Dame game and they got to win that one. I mean that is a, you know there are very few must win games early in the season, but they had to find a big non conference win. And that's their last chance, so they got to win that one. And they may need 120 points to do it too, because that game <laughs> there may be 250 combined points in that game with how those teams profile. You know, my final thought, it comes back to something I said on the last show. It comes back to something I said on the halftime show. You know, these games are about habits for Indiana. And, you know, I, I really I look at these last two games differently. I mean, the, you know, the Moorhead State win was a 33-point win over a team that came in, you know, in the 110s uh, in terms of their Ken Palm rating, you know, had some definite strengths in terms of their rebounding and some things they did well that Indiana flipped and, and played so well that they, you know, really did a good job against those strengths for Moorhead State. And I thought played with better habits on the defensive end, took care of the ball better. They only turned the ball over 18% of the time that game. And in tonight's game, you know, there were some flashy plays and there's some headlines like Yogi, who I thought played terrific uh, and, and you know, only you know, took care of the ball, too. I think he played 35 minutes, only had two turnovers to go with his 38 points. And so he certainly set the right tone. And yet there were other parts of this game that left you wanting, you know, as all three of you guys have talked about, too many turnovers, you know, defense where... You know, guys just aren't moving their feet, and it leads to picking up fouls. The officials were whistle-happy, but we also got caught, you know, bumping guys and not being quick enough with our feet. And so that's what kind of disappointed me about tonight's game is some of the the good parts about that Moorhead State game, I didn't see that same commitment to, to those good habits tonight. And so, you know, there's not a lot that we're going to be able to learn in the, in the McNeese State game. It's a game Indiana can probably play poorly and win by 30 points. And so it's not so much about the score. It's not so much about notching another win over a top 300 team. It's just about the habits. You know, does Troy continue to turn over four or five times? On the flip side, does he continue to attack the glass? Tom Crean mentioned in his post-game press conference that, that, that Troy was really obsessed with rebounding. Well, that's great, and we saw that at times last year. We haven't seen it this year. Now let's see it moving forward. And that's what we need to see are the habits of a good, solid, consistent winning team start to show up game after game. Right now, this is a team that's too up and down, too inconsistent, strengths one game or weaknesses the next and vice versa, and that's going to have to change if Indiana's going to go beat Notre Dame and if they're going to compete in the Big Ten. So it's nice to come back and get these two bounce-back victories after the Duke loss, one of them a little bit more impressive than the other, but now it's time to put 40 strong minutes together against McNeese State of good, solid basketball habits and use that as a springboard to win the Hoosiers definitely need against Notre Dame. We'll see if the Hoosiers can, can take that first step to doing that Saturday uh, against McNeese State. That game, I believe, starts at 5.30 Central Time, 6.30 Eastern. It is on TV. Uh, that is not a BTN Plus game. And the last thing I want to mention is I just want to give kudos to Andy Witchery, who did the play-by-play -play tonight for the BTN Plus broadcast. I thought he was outstanding. Uh, you couldn't tell that he wasn't a professional on the Big Ten Network. He was great, uh, provided great analysis, was very poised, and also you know, was really good at 
you know, putting in some numbers at different places that really helped to to kind of illustrate what was going on in the game. And I know these BTN Plus games are annoying because you got to pay nine ninety nine just to watch a game or two. But the one positive is it gives students like Andy a chance to be on there and broadcast a game to a wide audience. And I thought he took advantage, did a great job. So Andy, a tip of the cap to you uh, and to the entire IU Student U production because you guys did a wonderful job. All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Assembly Call. We appreciate it. Make sure you go get on the email list, assemblycall.com slash subscribe. Uh, you'll get our post-game email tomorrow and all the other correspondence that we send out. And we will talk to you all on Saturday after IU McNeese State. Have a good night and a great day. We'll talk to you then.